there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission, one message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Welcome to the program. I'm Rick Wiles. Today is Friday, July 6, 2012. New York emergency medicine physician Dr. Conrad Miller will be my guest today to talk about the ever-growing health dangers posed by the release of radioactive material from Fukushima, Japan. First, the headlines. The commander of Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps Aerospace Force declared that the Islamic nation's military has contingency plans in place to attack at least 35 U.S. military bases in the Middle East within minutes of a U.S. and or Israeli attack on Iran's nuclear facilities. Iranian Brigadier General Amir Ali Hajizadeh said that the American bases would be destroyed quickly by Iran's ballistic missile arsenal capable of reaching targets 1,300 miles away. The U.S. Navy's 5th Fleet is headquartered in Bahrain, a mere 120 miles from Iran. Russia is warning NATO-affiliated Western nations to not impose a no-fly zone on Syria, similar to what was done to Libya in the run-up to the killing of Colonel Gaddafi. And a high-ranking Russian defense official threatened to equip Iran with Russia's powerful S-300 air defense system capable of shooting down incoming missiles and aircraft. Mr. Ruslan Pukhov, a member of Russia's Defense Ministry Advisory Board, said the Kremlin may authorize the transfer of the S-300 system to Iran if the West brings down Syria's President Assad. Israeli military officials issued a stark warning to Hezbollah in Lebanon Six years since the Second Lebanon War, IDF officials said the next Israeli war with Hezbollah will involve massive ground invasion forces and it will inflict incredible damage on the city of Beirut. A senior IDF officer told Israeli news reporters, quote, the next war will be different. We'll have to attack with more force, more violently to halt any assault of the home front as quickly as possible, end of quote. He also predicted that Israel would send large numbers of infantrymen into Lebanon to cause massive damage to the city of Beirut. Brigadier General Harze Halevi, commander of IDF's Galilee Division, clearly said Israel will violently attack civilian population centers in the city of Beirut, Lebanon. He predicted the fighting will be fierce, in Lebanon's urban communities. One Israeli commander told a newspaper, there is no choice but to fight against the enemy where he is, and that is in the heart of a populated area. I should point out that Beirut has a significant Christian population. Obviously, the Christians will be in the line of fire between Hezbollah and Israeli soldiers. So let me ask you, do you think the Holy Spirit is giving dreams and visions right now to Beirut Christians, telling them to flee to another region before the war starts. Central banks tried again to pump the, uh, I should say, jumpstart the global economy yesterday by coordinating their effort to pump more funny money into the global financial system. It was another confirmation of an emerging financial crisis in the works. The combined action of some of the world's largest central banks to ease monetary policy failed to reassure nervous investors that the politicians and the bankers actually know what they're doing. Stock markets were down around the world today. 
There were further concerns that the global economy is slowing down when International Monetary Chief Christine Lagarde told an economic forum in Tokyo that the IMF's global economic forecast is far worse than the IMF predicted only three months ago. And while she was in Tokyo, I'm sure she read the news headlines that the Japanese government will, will run out of cash by the end of October. And remember that big announcement in late June by EU leaders who crowed again that they had solved the European debt crisis once and for all with their trillion-dollar bailout scheme? Well, word on the street today in Madrid is that Spanish banks will not get any of that bailout money until sometime after the first half of 2013. You guys are just going to have to hold on. Van Rumpai is coming with the bailout money. Not today, not tomorrow, sometime in 2013. Keep your eyes on the LIBOR banking scandal in the UK. This one threatens to bring down the whole stinking gang of banking thieves in the city of London. The banksters were caught rigging the interbank interest rate that sets rates on $350 trillion of loans. You know, it reminds me of something a close friend of mine said to me. It's about a year ago. Uh, he's a successful businessman, entrepreneur, investor. And, you know, daily he's pouring over the charts and uh, the you know, all the, the data coming in from around the world on stocks and bonds and commodities. And he's managing his, his very large portfolio, trying to make the right decision. You know what the Holy Spirit said to him? How long will you study the vital signs of a terminal patient? I thought about that today. How long will you study the vital signs of a terminal patient? My friend... The financial system is terminally ill. It's going down. The whole stinking thing is going down. And we can read these stories every day, can't we? But how much do we really need to know about it? It's going down. Are you prepared? Are you seeking the Lord? Are you fasting and praying? Are you asking God for a strategy to keep you afloat when this thing goes down? Because I'm telling you, it, there is a 150% chance the Western banking system is going to crash. Barack Hussein Obama, the Marxist communist, is preparing to sign the UN treaty to regulate your guns and ammo. I've been talking about this UN treaty ever since I went on the air in 1999. It's finally ready to be ratified by the UN. And here's, here's the problem. The little Kenyan dictator will sign it before it's sent to the U.S. Senate for ratification. Who needs the U.S. Senate? Who needs the Constitution when you're a Kenyan dictator over America? 130 Republican congressmen sent him a letter warning him to back off the U.N. gun grabber treaty. Fat chance. Obama is a Marxist communist. He could care less what the Congress says. He's a dictator. He's going to sign that treaty. He's going to implement a U.N. treaty to regulate your guns and ammo. What's he trying to do? He's trying to start a civil war. What I've been telling you for four years he's going to do. That civil war is getting very close. He wants that civil war. He needs that civil war in order to stay in power because nobody in their right mind will vote for him in November. And the U.N. wants a global billionaires tax, too. Yes, the U.N. is demanding a 1% tax on the wealth of all billionaires in the world and of course they want to manage that money a leaked u.s army military police training manual for civil disturbance operations is telling us how the u.s military will be used domestically to put down riots and confiscate firearms and even shoot american citizens the document was uh, a training course at the U.S. Army Military Police School in Fort McClellan. And uh, 
it outlines how military assets will be used to help local and state authorities restore and maintain law and order in the event of mass riots, civil unrest, or a declaration of martial law. It says the U.S. military assets will focus around breaking up unauthorized gatherings and by patrolling the disturbance area to prevent the commission of lawless acts. Uh, during operations to restore order, military forces may present a show of force, establish roadblocks, break up crowds, employ crowd control agents, patrol, serve as security forces or reserves, and perform other operations as required. It also talks about how internees, you know, people taken into concentration camps will be re-educated into de appreciating U.S. policies. And on page 20 of the manual, it talks about using deadly force in confronting dissidents. And it said, warning shots will not be fired. This is your military. Hey, it's not your military. It, it's, it's the military. The military has been taken over by the regime. How many American men really will shoot their uncles and brothers and cousins and nephews? There's going to be mass chaos when this happens. There'll be desertion. There'll be, there'll be uh, U.S. military units fighting against U.S. military units. You think... What do you think is going on in Syria? Army units fighting army units. This is what Obama is bringing to the USA. The same tactic, the same policy of chaos. Because Marxist communists need chaos in order to rule. I want to tell you something, folks. A day is coming very quickly when I have to make some very, very important decisions for the viability of of this ministry's future and for my safety. Please pray for me and do what God is telling you to do right now while you have the opportunity to use your material blessings for this ministry because that day is coming very fast. I'll take a break. I'll be back in a minute with Dr. Miller. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. Rick will return after this announcement. There's no place for pride in the life of a believer. Here's today's moment with Charles Stanley. You and I are absolutely totally dependent upon the grace of God every single day of our life, waking and sleeping. We're dependent upon Him. He says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in the proper time. God wants to, us to have a spirit of humility. Why? Because the truth is we are totally dependent upon Him. And if you want to see real pride, you talk to somebody, or if you watch the TV and listen to a lot of stuff that goes on, watch these people strapping around and so forth as if they control the world. The truth is, they come on the scene and they're, they're on all the programs and all of a sudden, next thing you know, they're gone. You say, I wonder what happened to them. I'll tell you. God will displace you. If pride is in your heart, He's coming after it because He hates it. The reason God hates the pride, not the person, but the pride is because it says, I have no need. I can handle it. The truth is, you and I can't handle it. If it were not for the grace of God, listen, we would not have good health. You would not have your job. In other words, we could just go right down the list of all the ways God expresses goodness and kindness and love, His undeserved, unearned favor, His grace. Now, if you think about grace, G-R-A-C-E, look at this. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. That is, every good thing that comes your way and my way comes to us by, listen, and through and because of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Now watch this. When God said to mankind, the soul that sinneth it shall die, the wages of sin is death. Man sinned against God and therefore for God to be who he is, then he had to deal with this. And that is man's sin. But in the coming of Jesus Christ, which was his gift of grace, he paid our sin debt in full. And having paid our sin debt in full, it makes it possible for God to do what? To be gracious to us. 
to forgive us of our sin because his son paid our sin debt in full. Otherwise, we would have had to pay it. Everywhere you turn in your life, there is the grace of God. Learn more about God's grace when you visit the All Things Are New section at intouch.org. Well, welcome back to True News, your alternative source for world news and analysis. I'm Rick Wiles. Sixteen months after the triple catastrophe that struck Japan on March 11, 2011, the Japanese government continues to lie to its citizens, and the corporate-controlled news media in the USA, Canada, and Europe continues to black out the truth about what is happening right now in Fukushima. Badly damaged reactor number four has bulging walls, and the building is tilting. A powerful typhoon this summer or another earthquake could easily topple the weakened structure. Nobody really knows what is happening beneath the damaged reactors. We could have a China syndrome scenario underway, and nobody knows about it except the top elite. Highly radioactive water continues to pour into the Pacific Ocean. Radiation continues to drift into the atmosphere. A debris field the size of the state of California is drifting in the Pacific Ocean towards North America. Japanese debris has been found throughout the coastlines of Canada and the USA. Alaskan polar bears are dying of skin lesions. Sea lions, too. Large numbers of dead dolphins and pelicans have washed up on shore in Peru, and over 300 Alaska airline flight attendants have mysterious skin lesions and hair loss. Cesium has been discovered in bluefin tuna fish along the California coast and also in seaweed. Japanese children have cesium in their urine, and Japanese lakes and rivers are contaminated with cesium. But don't wait on the government or the news media to inform you. Whatever information we have is coming from alarmed and informed citizens who are researching the crisis and getting the information out to the public through alternative news outlets such as True News. One such man is on the telephone right now, Dr. Conrad Miller. He specializes in emergency medicine at Brookhaven Memorial Hospital Medical Center in Patchogue, New York. And he is closely following the situation at Fukushima, Japan. I have him on the phone right now. Dr. Miller, welcome to True News. Thanks for having me on your show. Yes, sir. Well, uh, tell me, um, wh- first of all, are, are, you, um, are you convinced that the Japanese government is uh, lying to the public? Well, they're not telling all the truth. And uh, they, they're working on... Uh, protecting TEPCO, and then there's the tight ties between the government and TEPCO. A lot of the government people who, when they go out of the government, they go and work for TEPCO, and they become a vice president for TEPCO. So their interests aren't very good in terms of protecting the people right now, but that's not unusual for nuclear power all over the world. So so, so what they are telling the public, it's, it's, it's selective truth. Because withholding information is, is, to me, the same as, as lying. When you know something that could harm somebody and you're not telling them, uh, it's the same as lying. And we, we just found out recently that the U.S. The US government was giving uh, the Japanese government in the days after the earthquake, uh, we were providing them with satellite uh, uh, you know, information about where the radiation clouds were drifting, and the Japanese government did not tell their citizens, and they knew that the the refugees were literally going into the most heavily radiated areas, and they would not tell them. Well, the United States didn't do much better. I agree. We had had all the um, those same uh, pieces of information and... um, Kept it quiet. And then we had the... uh, the the uh, units of in the in the units of you can cut out some of this I'm just trying to think of the word um, 
the plumes. We had them tracked mm-hmm. and uh, didn't really report them very much. And then the United States has decided not to monitor the fish. And then Hillary Clinton, I'm not sure exactly when she did this. I'm not sure if it was this month or last month or was it last year. She signed an agreement with the, with the Japanese that uh, we won't monitor any of the food imports coming to the United States for radiation. That's right. So that's uh, another thing. And then another interesting thing in terms of the media, which seems to be where you're thinking a lot of, about uh, this whole problem, which is a big problem, and the way we frame our debates, and that is uh, though we had that report about the tuna. Now, you heard about that, right? Yes. Well, when did you hear about it? Uh, I think it was a month or two ago. Right. Do you know when, that, when they caught those fish? No. It was August 2011. And they just released the information. Yeah, that's kind of scary. So, and then and when you're talking about the uh, the fish and the contamination, the um, uh, cesium that they mention is just one radionuclide. It's the easiest one to test for. But the reality is that that's not the only radionuclide that's in anything that gets contaminated with Radiation. There's all the radionuclides that come out of a uh, of a nuclear plant, from fissioning uranium to make heat, to produce steam, to turn a turbine. That that's uh, all these radionuclides come out, and they, we can't measure most of them. So the easiest one to me- measure, for some reason, is the cesium. And the cesium, it may not be very high now, but I'd like to see them catch some more tuna now. And see what their what their levels are now, because what's happening is the water's coming out every day in billions of becquerels of cesium from the rivers out of Fukushima, and those are accumulating in the mud, in the like you said in the kelp, in the seaweed, in the plankton, and then the fish are eating them. The smaller fish, the anchovies that they caught off of Japan are doing uh, are counting up about 60 becquerels uh, per second which means a tick on the when you hear a tick on your Geiger counter that's a becquerel per second and then the, they're down the food chain so other animals are eating the anchovies and other fish and then the tuna fish are eating those uh, fish and then higher up the food chain it all bioaccumulates so as time goes along actually the levels in the tuna, I expect they're going to go up and up and up and up until they finally somehow stop the leaking of, of the radioactive water out of those buildings where they have thousands of gallons of radioactive water in each building. All the buildings are leaking, according to Arnie Gunderson, and uh, they get into the, that water gets into the groundwater, and then the groundwater seeps into the rivers. And now they're finding all these fish that are there in Fukushima that have crazy levels of uh, cesium. And we're talking about freshwater fish. And in, freshwater fish. Freshwater the, fish yes. Well, freshwater fish in Fukushima is what we're talking about right now. Yes. But also, as you go out into the ocean, of course, it's, right. it's bad, too. And what happens is the radiation concentrates or is washed out of the atmosphere with the rain and the snow and the melts, and then it drifts in, into the groundwater and gets into the rivers. So especially when those kind of things happen, you get higher amounts of radiation in the rivers and then in the fish that, can, that are in the water. And they're finding the radiation in the, in the river and lake silt, the mud. Right. Uh, it's, it's accumulating in the mud. Yes, that's where it seems to be dropping into. It's not just diluting into the water. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to be working that way. Even if they world, stopped all of the leaking right now, 100% stopped. The damage is already done. It, it would help, though, if they could do that. Well, it would help, but the damage is already done. I mean, you, you can't go out there with a sponge and soak up uh, no, but the radiation. Thing is, at least you could, yes, but the thing is you could at least stop that radiation from continuing to go out to the Pacific and basically contaminate the entire Pacific Ocean, the entire Pacific Basin, like half the planet, which really is what's happening. So if they could stop the leaks, that would help. But according to some of the information I just uh, received, the government said that TEPCO is not responsible 
to entomb the plants, the reactors, and neither is the government. But what happened at Chernobyl was they sent in about 700,000 liquidators, quote-unquote. Many of them got liquidated, of course. Uh, mostly conscripts from the uh, various armed services, and they had to go in, and they're the ones that did the work to make a sarcophagus, which is what they used to entomb the Chernobyl plant, which is only one plant, only one reactor compared to the four that are on the grounds at Fukushima. And then that would help. Of course, today, it's, what, 26 years after the accident in Chernobyl, that sarcophagus is leaking. And they're begging for money, the Ukraine, for help to make another one. And we don't know what's going on below these reactors. No, we don't. And the unfortunate thing is, well, we do know there's tons of, of radioactive water. That's what we know. Yes. We do know that the first three plants have had meltdowns, numbers one, two, and three, uh, and then they poured water in there to, and I think they have to keep doing it, and then there's still leaks in all the plants and the walls, so that water that's going in to cool the, uh, the, the cells of fuels, uh, that, that continues to go in and the leaks come out the bottom. So it's still going on. So we don't know exactly what's going on there, but we know enough to say that it's leaking. It's leaking, it's getting into the groundwater, and it's just continuing to make this vicious cycle. And then we have, we have the, the, the real and present danger of, of reactor number four with bulging walls. The building is tilting. It, it's structurally very weakened. Uh, a typhoon, when Japan is in the typhoon season right now, a typhoon could, could uh, finish this thing off. Um, another earthquake, magnitude 7 or higher, uh, definitely will bring this thing down. Maybe even less. Or, or even less. And, yeah, and it just has to actually, um, a little more background on that fuel pool number four. This is from uh, Fairwinds, which is Arnie Gunderson's uh, site. Right. Um, he says that what they have to do, what they did, they put a tarpaulin over the top, which sounds like that would at least prevent things from just going up into the air. But he said it doesn't really do that. It's, it's really to protect the, the fuel. It's the fuel pool, not the reactor. That's the problem, right? Mm -hmm. It's the fuel pool that's sitting up there about yes. 100 feet up. And, uh, and that's what's tilting. And that has all the fuel assemblies in it. And what they're trying to do is keep that covered, because if it gets uncovered, if the fuel assemblies get uncovered, then they could have a criticality result, and then you could have the fire, and then the fire can release all that cesium, and uh, that cesium is somewhere between 8 and 10 million curies, I think it was. Uh, eight, no, 8 to 10 times the amount of cesium released by Chernobyl, that's what it is. And, um, of course, that would be disastrous for the planet, because it would just go all around the planet in the air, but what they're doing is that they would have to, according to uh, Mr. Gunderson, they would have to, the plan would be to get a cask into the fuel pool somehow, which they'd have to use a special crane, not a construction crane, that, had, that has to hold 150 tons at least, they have to get it into the fuel pool to get some of the assemblies into the cask. That's what they would have to do which I don't know if they figured out how to do it yet. That's why they haven't done it. Otherwise, if they drop it, if they drop the cask, it'll probably go right through the fuel pool and go right, fall straight through, you know, if it's 150 tons, it'll probably go right through the fuel pool, right down to the bottom of the, the, the re what's left of the reactor, and that'll make a hole in the fuel pool, drain all the water out, and boom, there you go. How is this affecting you personally? Well, I'm very paranoid, you know. I'm, I'm happy I'm not in California right now because obviously a little more of the fallout from this has gone there. And I, I'm a surfer, and I've surfed all around the world, and I lived in Hawaii for a while, but I don't really want to ever go to the Pacific Ocean again. That's how it's affected me mostly. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to eat tuna anymore. I don't want to eat anything out of the Pacific Ocean anymore. It may not be bad, you know, some things you get may be okay, and some things you don't know. 
it doesn't take much, you know, to cause a little mutation in a cancer in your DNA. So uh, people have to be aware of this, and that's one of the reasons they're not talking about it. I mean, the, two, the, the taboo against reporting nuclear news has long been uh, present in the media. But for this not to get reported the way you just opened the show, with all the things you said, none of that's being said. So it's really, like you say, it's, it's a crime, really, to not report those things, make a deal to let the food imports come from Japan and not test them. Don't test the fish because you don't want to know because then you'll have it on record. I mean, it's, it's all pretty sick. That's right. It's pretty, it's pretty sick. I mean, the main answer, obviously, is to, that nuclear power has to stop. It has to be it sh- when, nuclear, when Fukushima happened, that should have been it. That should have been, the world should have just said, okay. Shut them all we down. Get it. Yeah, we, that's it. They should be all shut down. Japan shut all their reactors down. But now they're restarting them. They're trying to restart the two in Ojai. Mm-hmm. And what happened was the people there are angry. And they were surrounding the prime minister's house every day. And the closer, and they were going to open them. I don't know what happened. I can't tell you. It's the fifth now. They were opening them in Ojai. Uh, there was two reactors on July first, and uh, that it, it, the crowd around the, the prime minister's house had gotten up to forty-five thousand people protesting around his house, so that he wouldn't do it. But of course, uh, whatever he's doing, he's going to do it anyway. Is, isn't and, it amazing how these politicians, regardless of what country they're in, they just completely ignore? the mass of people, they just do what they want to do. I mean, they do what they're told to do. That's really what it comes down to. They, do, they don't work for the people. They work for, for very powerful uh, individuals and organizations and corporations and entities, and they don't really care what the people say. Well, that, some do and some don't. But the prime minister who was active during the uh, event on March 11th, uh, I think he's trying to stop nuclear power he was but but uh, then they try to blackball him away from doing that and now the, the new prime minister is trying to get them open of course like you say pushed by industry because ohai is in one of the most important industrial districts of japan and so they wanted those reactors open but what the japanese people they have a different culture there so the federal government doesn't quite rule as tightly over each area as it does in the United States. And there, the local, if the local people decide they don't want to open a reactor, each reactor to reopen is going to be an individual battle, it looks like at this point. And uh, it turns out, uh, from what I've read, that the, the Japanese mafia doesn't want them to open. I don't know exactly why, probably because if... They probably want to try to sell what they have, and then, you know, the reactor's going back online and more contamination results in other Fukushima. Well, you know, that's that's another thing I've read about, uh, products coming out of Japan, food products and other things that have been relabeled. Oh, they relabeled? I didn't know I, that. I've, I've, I've read these stories that the, the, that the products have been relabeled uh, either with uh, dates prior to Fukushima or, you know, geographical uh, location away from Fukushima. So we don't know what we're getting out of Japan right now. Um, worst case scenario, if, if Reactor 4 topples over the the, the cooling pool. Uh, yeah, the fuel pool. It, yes, if it uh, drains out, the fuel rods are exposed, we have an explosion. Uh, many experts have told me that depending on what actually takes place, the city of Tokyo will have to be evacuated. So we're talking about 34, 35 million people. But also, um, the the northern jet stream is going to carry possibly several hundred tons of radioactive material in the atmosphere across the planet, which is going to go up to Alaska, down the west coast, and then across the continental United States, and then out over the Atlantic towards Great Britain and Europe. If that happens... If you wake up one morning, Dr. Miller, and you, you, you discover that Reactor 4 exploded, what are you going to do? There's not much you can do, really. I mean, you can take your uh, SSKI, you know, your iodine, uh, 
so that uh, the radioactive iodine doesn't get into the thyroid that you have. But that's just one little radionuclide of the more than 1,400 that are produced by the fissioning of uranium. Mm -hmm. So um, the the radioactive iodine, I think it has a half-life of 6 hours or 12 hours, something like that. So actually, after a few days, that should be gone. But um, the other things that come across, of course, the most dangerous one is plutonium. And that one, it's just a millionth of a gram. Uh, It gets into your lung. That can cause a lung cancer. It usually takes 20 or 30 years to kill you. But uh, you got to worry about that. Then there's strontium. Uh, That's taken up by the body like it's calcium, except it's not calcium, but it gets into your bones, and then that's the and then it radiates the marrow. So you get you can get leukemia, you can get bone cancer. Those are the most popular ones that people know about, and probably the most toxic ones. And actually, uh, a nuclear plant, the biggest volume of nuclear waste or combustion, for example, that would result if there is a fire or an explosion. Fire is probably more likely. Uh, that cesium would probably all be released and that would just travel around the world and cesium in, in your body because you can't you don't incinerate the radioactive element it just uh, just goes up mm-hmm. travels around the cesium is is recognized in your body as potassium now everybody's talking about that that cesium is a muscle seeker so it gets into your muscles and it gets into your heart. And there actually was research done on that by a doctor in, I guess, in the USSR, or maybe a Russian doctor. Or no, he was in Belarus, uh, Belarus. And he wrote, wrote a book, I believe, and did some research on it. Uh, and the book was called Chernobyl Heart. And the Chernobyl Heart is a heart that's damaged by cesium because you know, your heart's a muscle. So the cesium goes to your heart, and apparently it... it uh, makes problems with your heart. For example, I think they had more holes in the heart and people were dying much younger. People were being, babies were being born contaminated by cesium and it was affecting their heart. And guess what the government did in that country to that guy? Tell me. Put him in jail. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah, man. And of course, that happened to other doctors too, though, in, in the USSR. Because after the accident, it was still the USSR. Here in the United States, we we just send the IRS after them. Yeah, or something, but not like that. That's yeah. Crazy. We we don't they we don't lock people up for for reporting the truth. We just we just bust them with the IRS. Yeah, well, there's lots of ways to do it. Yeah. What they also did to the doctors there was they they put them in in psychiatric institutes too mm-hmm. when they were reporting findings. Anyway, but back to the cesium. Okay, so what really happens with the cesium though? It does go to your heart. It does go to your muscle. But the truth is that c that cesium recognize potassium. Potassium is the most common electrolyte in all your cells. So really, the season goes to all your cells. It could be that this part, that, and that makes it probably the worst of all the radionuclides because it goes to all your cells. Then it gets into the cells and it emits these little beams of radioactivity that hit your DNA. And sometimes the DNA will re- repair itself spontaneously and sometimes it won't. And then sometimes you get a mutation, and sometimes, and it could be all kinds of weird things, that could be a perpetuator forever by your genes, or it could cause a cancer, which could kill you eventually or immediately or whatever it is. So that's cesium. And that's, uh, it's, so it's very ubiquitous in your body, and uh, it's kind of frightening it's just that these things it just don't exist in the, real, in the natural world. They only exist from the fissioning of uranium. And, and, and our, our listeners need to understand that, that if this worst-case scenario would happen with Fukushima and, and, and the, the clouds uh, reach North America and Europe, we're not talking about people falling over dead you know, the first day, the first week. It, that's not the way it works as a doctor. We're talking about a, a silent, invisible um, contamination of the cells of your body and this is going to be present in your life for many years. You, people are going to see, uh, they're going to see cancers. They're going to see mutations. They're going to see various ailments and illnesses. Uh, so it's not necessarily that people are going to fall over dead uh, the week after Fukushima goes over. Uh, 
but you know one one thing that I'm concerned about, doctor, is uh, the contamination of the food supply. If, if right. hundreds of tons of radioactive fallout is dropping on North America and Europe, then the farms are going to be contaminated for hundreds of years. Right. The cesium has a half-life of 30 years. So half of the radioactivity is still present after 30 years. And then it has a hazardous life. The hazardous life of any radionuclide is 10 to 20 times the half-life. So for cesium, that's 300 to 600 years. And 40% of nuclear waste, any nuclear waste or burning or whatever, is cesium. So more or less, you've got 300 to 600 years of contamination that goes on from that. And for, for Chernobyl, that's why the, the man who was responsible for the cleanup at Chernobyl, he said that, uh, that you could, nobody really should be living within 100, at least 100 miles for 300 to 600 years. And, of course, he died from cancer after he, he was the man who was responsible for the cleanup. And he was a, a physicist, too, mm-hmm. and he was the head of the, uh, the scientific society in the Ukraine. Uh, do you suspect, and, and this, I know this is totally speculation, unless you have some kind of information, but do, do you suspect that that the um, the elite in this country and other countries are fully aware of the level of danger and that they are making plans for their own safety? Mm, I'm sure some of them are denying it. They're human beings. Mm-hmm. They want to deny. People deny. You know, they don't want to know mm-hmm. the truth themselves. So, and they probably do make uh, plans to weather the storm. But of course, it's really not going to happen to them much. It's going to happen to them too. Uh, I don't know how much. I don't know how much of a conspiracy it really is. I don't think anybody's trying to kill anybody or anything like that. Well, I don't think so either. But I, I'm just. I, you I know. just think. I just think that that people. They, the whole debate about nuclear power or any major um, movement or technology is framed in the media, whichever way it is, and the debate is always skewed. Like, nuclear power is the greatest example, probably, because people, you know, they keep fighting about the waste or what should we do with it. They had a big uh, article in the New York Times today about that. Oh, uh, we have to... Do something with it. We have to send it to Yucca Mountain. And we, and then there's no facts about Yucca Mountain when they put the article out. But there's 33 earthquake faults at Yucca Mountain, and they've had six. They had 600 earthquakes between 1976 and 1990 that were 2.5 or greater on the Richter scale. So that's why there's no reason to use Yucca Mountain. Plus, it's about 100 miles away or less from Las Vegas, and then President Obama. One of the best things he did so far as president was he nixed that whole thing at Yucca Mountain. It's not going to happen as long as he's president unless he gives in to somebody somewhere. But I don't think he will. Uh, I'm trying to recall. It's, it's been maybe uh, three, four months ago. I had a doctor in the program. He was part of a medical team that uh, released a report based on what happened in in the USA after Chernobyl, the number of of deaths that were reported there was a spike in deaths uh i forget the time frame uh after chernobyl and these doctors uh, estimated the number of people that they believe have already died in the usa from fukushima yes, just simply based was, on on that was jeanette sherman right jeanette sherman and then uh, alexei uh, yablikov did the that big, big, big study that said about a million people have died so far from Chernobyl. something like that, and I uh, and I forget uh, who 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 the doctor was that was on the program. Yeah, it was probably uh, was it a woman? No, it was a, a gentleman. Oh, who, who co-wrote the story? Yeah, uh, with, the, with co-wrote her. the report. Um, yeah. uh, but but I mean, we do have. I mean, we we can look at past events such as Chernobyl, and we can make intelligent, reasonable estimates of what has already happened in the USA. And so we, we know that there, you know, there are many people that have already died. Their families don't know why their loved ones died. 
No one's going to oh. tell them, you know, your your uncle, your mother, your your son died because of Fukushima. This this stuff is being kept quiet. Well, they, I think Jeanette Sherman and that same other person, I forget his name now, begins with an M. I think they also reviewed the statistics relative to Fukushima. I think it was Dr. Mandano. Man, it's something like that. Yes, mm-hmm. uh, uh, terrible, I don't remember his name exactly. He's, he's written a lot of things about mm-hmm. uh, uh uh, these kind of things. Um, according to another thing that I, I read about um, relative to the Fukushima and the deaths, is that as of September 3rd of 2011, there were 34,000 excess unexplained deaths in the United States after March 11th, which 2011, that's when Fukushima uh, occurred, the tsunami, earthquake, and uh, explosions and meltdowns and so on. So, um, 34,000 unexplained 30, 34,000, yeah. And then uh, they were actually, these are figures, they actually broke them down into, the CDC actually was doing research on this. They have the numbers. I'll give them to you if you want. Uh, the CDC knows that there's about that many excess deaths. They broke them down into different areas of the United States. For example, um, in the region around Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma, there's about 8,730, 8,730 unexplained deaths, excess deaths. And um, in the mountains around, uh, Mon- from Montana down to Mexico, the rate was 9.1 increase in deaths, which was about 7,723 deaths. Because in the mountains, then there's more washout from rain. When the rain comes, like I said before, it takes the it cleans the atmosphere out, but it takes all the the particles that are in this in the air that it's drifting around the planet. It's that are still in the troposphere, that's the lowest part of the atmosphere, and it washes them down to the earth. So it's going to oh, you're going to get a rush of radiation concentrating in the rivers and the and the and the lakes and so on. And what was said uh, one of the days on May seventh. They said that um, that was a, there was a big peak that day in some of these areas, and I think it was four times the number of deaths occurred that day. So people, the people that are dying, so actually people are dying, um, but we can't really prove it, you know, because yes. you've you got to really research it the right way. That's right. And uh, well, you know, in those in those days and weeks uh, after Fukushima, I was saying on the radio, if there's ever been a time that we need a drought, this is it. The last thing we need is heavy rain. Right. Well, they're getting it in the Midwest. They got yes. a big drought in the Midwest right yes. now. But but in those in those immediate weeks and months after Fukushima, the, the heavy rains that came across North America, um, you know, only God knows how many people uh, were were contaminated with isotopes from from Fukushima. I re, I remember here in Florida, there we, we had a period of uh, a, a week or two of very heavy rains in the spring of of 2011 i i didn't want to go outside it's like yeah i i do not want to go out in this rain yes and yeah like that's that's the, one of the big things stay when the when it rains and it's close to something happening like if fuel pool four catches fire yeah you, de- you definitely want to stay out of the rain a couple other things about these um these uh, mutations uh, that are being discovered and so on mm-hmm. one of the Strange birth defects that occurs from radiation is called cyclopia. That's when your baby's born one eye, like yes. one eye in the middle of their head. Yes. That's been occurring in Iraq from all the depleted uranium. Mm-hmm. And then after Fukushima, they caught some sharks in the Sea of Cortez between Baja and the mainland, and they found some female sharks there with unborn baby sharks that had cyclopia. I have so not heard this. Yeah, so that's already happened. And then they I have seen the photographs, these horrifying photographs from from Chernobyl. Yeah. But you're saying that there's already confirmed cases right now uh sharks. involving sharks. Yeah. And and you you're saying this is also this is taking place in Iraq from the depleted uranium from the yeah, US bombs. That's well that's the information that's coming out, yeah. There's a whole thing about depleted uranium that's worth about probably about a year's worth of conversation. Mhm. But 99% of the uranium that is mined 
ends up as depleted uranium, which has a four, it's, was it four million? I think it's a four billion year half-life. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and though it may not emit that much time along by the second, like a, a quickly deteriorating short half-life um, radio uh, nuclide will cause more damage because it's, it's deteriorating more quickly. Chris, you know, there's another component in this whole thing with Japan that few people have talked about. We have mentioned it uh, from time to time since last year. And, and I actually mentioned it uh, days before the earthquake. And that is the governor of Tokyo, three or four days before the earthquake, uh, gave a speech in which he said Russia, China, and North Korea were enemies of Japan. Uh-huh. And, the, and the Japan would would be in production of nuclear warheads before 2011 end would end and of course uh, three or four days later we have fukushima and and then we we discover that one of the one of the reactors was was producing plutonium and i don't well, know very many people that were aware of that before the event and well then, you know the the um well this the original nuclear power plant mm-hmm. was made to produce plutonium for the first atomic bombs. And then somebody said, oh, this would be a great way to boil water to make electricity. And it will be too cheap to meter. And that's how nuclear power plants started. Mm-hmm. And then from the other end of the spectrum, they have uh, they tried to do these uh, sodium-cooled um, reactors, the breeder reactors, uh, in a few places in the world, including, including Japan, but of course they had these terrible sodium fires, so it's more or less been abandoned. And they would uh, you, they would generate a little bit of plutonium and also burn it. But then they have the now they're using these things called these MOX uh, reactors. What they do is when they are uh, using the fuel, they put plutonium in the reactor. So that way. Uh, They'll get rid of the plutonium. I don't know if they end ends up making more plutonium, because every nuclear plant plant produces between four hundred and a thousand pounds of plutonium every year. So, well, what's interesting is that several weeks ago, J- Japan resumed their production of plutonium, and then days after the plutonium production restarted, the Japanese parliament, the Diet, passed a, a law in which the the language of Japan's uh, nuclear policy was was changed. And now they brought into the official language of, 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 of the country's nuclear policies that nuclear power would be uh, would would be uh, built for national security purposes. And there were a lot of people in Asia who were reading between the lines saying, hey, wait a minute, Japan has just basically... Uh, legalized the the production of nuclear warheads. So something may something bigger may be underway here that we we don't fully see the you know, the full picture yet of what is going on uh, right now. But what we do know is that it's an extremely dangerous uh, situation for the whole planet. And as you said at the beginning of this interview, TEPCO doesn't know how to fix it. They don't have any plan. Um, uh, they're trying to get out of the responsibility for it. This thing, if, if even without a collapse of of the reactors, uh, it, very well, two or three, four years from now, it still could be sitting there in the same condition. That's what. That's what. Well, yeah, and it still could be leaking. And it the still could be leaking. leaking. Goes on, it's, that's it's right. Just keep doing this to the planet. And, that's and right. To the Pacific, and eventually, uh, the, a little bit of good news for you. Uh, there's a there's a magazine called Granta. I don't know if you ever heard of it. No. It's an English magazine. comes out quarterly. It's actually a literature magazine. And every issue has a featured theme. Sometimes it's sex. Sometimes it's war. Sometimes it's poetry. Sometimes it's new writers. And uh, issue 83 had the environment as the issue. And there was an article in it about the Greenland pump. And that is... Uh, an expression that they use to show how the water moves south past Greenland. And what they said in that article, which is a little bit encouraging, is that 
uh, now, of course, uh, this, this magazine was probably about seven years ago, the water from Greenland takes about 100 years to get to the Pacific. So hopefully, and vice versa. Hopefully. Hopefully. That's what so we... In other words, the Atlantic Ocean is much safer right now. So if you're going to eat anything and you're worried, I mean, there's still going to be some of the fallout from Fukushima that does end up in the Atlantic Ocean from the air. But from the water, it probably won't, won't be that way. So you probably are right to, to swim and so on and, and, and eat fish out of the Atlantic for a while, for probably the next 100 years at least. Well, that is, that is uh, encouraging. Uh, my guest today, Dr. Conrad Miller, um, specialist in emergency medicine in, in um, New York State. And uh, his website is crestofthewave.com, crestofthewave.com. And he's also the author of a book, Most Important Issues um, That, uh, let me get this right, uh, the most important issues that people Americans think, think they think, know enough about. Think they know enough about. Right. And one chapter is on nuclear power. There's only six chapters in the book. And I have the whole nuclear power chapter, if you want to read about it, with the background, the story about Chernobyl, uh, in food uh, radiation, and uh, Yucca Mountain. That's for free on the website. It's like an e-chapter. You can just go to the website on the homepage and click on it, and you can read the whole chapter for All free. All right. That's crestofthewave.com. Again, the book, The Most Important Issues That Americans Think They Know Enough About. Uh, my guest, Dr. Conrad Miller. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Appreciate you being on True News. Okay, Rick, and thanks very much for having me. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ, you're listening to True News, the End Time Newscast. This is Max McLean. Let us remember all that God has given to His people. Listen to the Bible from Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love is endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. From Psalm 107, listen to the Bible. It's great for the soul. The Listener's Bible may be a great way to help you devote more time in God's Word. To find out more, go to radiobible.org. That's radiobible.org. The danger from Fukushima, Japan, is a real and present danger. Radiation has been falling on us in the Northern Hemisphere for 16 months. It's falling day after day it's falling from the sky on us it's in the water in the Pacific it's in the food that we're eating if you're getting seafood from the Pacific Ocean there is one thing one thing only that can inoculate your body from the danger of the Fukushima radiation it is the blood of Jesus Christ there is nothing else to protect us there is nothing else to protect you and me from this radiation. Only the blood of Jesus Christ. We have entered the last days, and you must be under the blood of the Lamb of God. For there is no other protection for men and women on this earth. And for you to be under the blood, it means that you need to be living righteously. That means stop sinning. Live right for God and worship Him, the Creator, 